Hi, and welcome back to This Week in Voice for July 13th, 2017. We're very pleased today to have three phenomenal guests. We'll start with Lisa Foxen. Lisa, say hello. Hello, nice to be here. Lisa, thank you very much for being here and joining us. Lisa is an experienced designer of speech-enabled multimodal applications on various platforms. She is also a member of the Board of Directors of Stanford Professional Women. Lisa, do you mind taking a second and explaining to me in the audience what that is? Sure, uh, no problem. So Stanford Professional Women is really an organization for um, sharing and networking um, between various different alums, um, staff members, and faculty. And so we host events throughout the year, usually one to two per month, and they vary from large speaker events to smaller networking events. And the idea is... um, a lot of the younger alums coming right out of school, needing that professional support from other women in their industry and helping them along with their careers. So we facilitate that. That's really cool. Thank you for sharing that with us, and thank you for sharing your time sure. with us today. Brian Romley is our second guest. Brian, say hello. Hello. Glad to be here, Bradley. Thank you very much for joining us, Brian. Uh, Brian, I just subscribed to mul- the Multiplex app for twenty nine ninety nine. Um, it is phenomenal. Uh, if you're listening to this podcast, you need to stop what you're doing, hit pause, hit stop for all I care. Go to readmultiplex.com, download the app, purchase a subscription. You'll be glad that you did. Thank you, Bradley. And I want to let everybody know I just put out an Android version. It's in early alpha stages, so it's a little little shaky, but give it a try. But thank you. Sure. Our third guest is Dr. Ahmed Bouzid. Ahmed, say hello. Uh, hello, Bradley. How are you? Doing good. Ahmed is CEO and founder of Witlingo, which just this week rolled out a the ability to turn your Facebook page, if you're any business, any organization, uh, on Facebook, you can turn your Facebook page into an Alexa skill. You need to stop what you're doing again. You hit the hit the pause button a few <laughs> minutes ago to go get Multiplex. You need to hit it again. Go to witlingo.com. The first 100 businesses to sign up uh, have all their fees waived to get their organization's Facebook page turned into an Alexa skill. You need to go do that. Thank I got to right. say, I, I got to say, I got to say, gentlemen and uh, and Lisa, this is a phenomenal, phenomenal skill. If you have a business and you do not have a voice enablement uh, of it using Ahmed's uh, amazing system, get it right now. You'll really, really thank me. Thank, th- thank you, Ra. I appreciate it that very much. Thanks, a lot. very cool, Ahmed. And my name is Bradley Metrock. I'm CEO of a company called Score Publishing, based here in Nashville. And with that, we'll get to the news. So our first story for this week is that, and this is added uh, at the very last minute, I might add, is that Amazon is contemplating releasing user data to developers in the form of voice transcripts for how people are interacting with Alexa and what, what they're saying, triggering an entirely new privacy debate. So, Lisa, we'll start with you. Sure. Is this something that Amazon should be doing, or are we all missing the boat on larger privacy concerns with this? Yeah, I don't really see an issue with it. We, um, When I first participated in the early betas, I was actually at Amazon um, and working on the ecosystem. You know, people were very, very concerned about privacy and they thought, oh, people aren't going to want to have a always listening device. Um, they thought that that would kind of be a deal breaker for folks. And when it really launched, it ended up not being a, a big deal at all. And so I think... Um, the advantage we're actually going to see from having this important data available to the developers is going to outweigh the cost um, to the user. And in reality, there it isn't a huge change in that um, all that data was already being stored anyway. It's just a matter of how it was available and who it was available to. You know, Bradley, fundamentally, what we're talking about is a larger issue, ultimately. And I think what the reporters and a lot of the red herring sort of issues uh, that came up was more based on this fear of people listening to you all the time. And that's a very real fear. But uh, it's also part of a larger uh, uh, situation about context. And that means as these systems develop into true personal assistants, that's where they really have deep context about, uh, about who you are, you know, where you've been, what you eat, where you go, what you shop, all this type of things to make them really useful. And it's a great payoff to have this. 
we are going to have to have this, what I call the decision of this epoch on who gets to control that information, who gets to audit that information, how is it secured, et cetera. Because, I mean, we've given up a whole lot with social media and Gmail. This is orders of magnitude more uh, complex and more impactful for that individual if that data was to be released or to be taken by uh, rogue elements within organizations, even within governments and some parts of the world, uh, it can be very dangerous for a person. So that's the greater issue. The small issue is this is, this is utterances. These are, these are phrases that people speak to the app or to the skill. And for the developer to really fine tune under these current developer tools that are out there, in the future, this will be different, but under the current developer tools, we need to know what you're saying to the app so that we can fine tune it to better serve you. And so all we're getting is different ways of saying, read a book or read me that book or, you know, all these different variations. So it was really that kind of thing. And I know Ahmed had did a lot to try to clear this up. Um, uh, you went out and, and sort of straightened a few people out, huh? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I, I, just to uh, put on, on what you guys have been saying, it, the, the the bottom line really is that, uh, number one, Amazon um, and actually Google and, and Microsoft have, have already been doing this for a while now since their SDKs came out, has come out, is they have been sharing the uh, information. Um, uh, number one. Number two, it, it is not, as Brian said, it is not everything that you say. It is specific to the skills um, and and imagine building a mobile app and releasing it and not being able to tell what are people clicking on and what buttons they are or what you know what are they filling what Dropbox uh, items are they choosing um, so that they can iterate and iterate and deliver a much uh, much better experience. So I think um, I think there's a lot of education educating that needs to be done in terms of ensuring that uh, the stories that are written out there are accurate. Um, but I think, uh, I, think, I think it's true also that uh, there are concerns that we need to keep top of mind as we, um, and as we move forward with these interesting uh, interfaces. i got to jump in. Ahmed, how do you feel about maybe this whole industry trying to get together about understanding what the privacy profiles are going to look like, uh, whether or not we're going to just open it up for everybody's context to be uh, bought and sold uh, to advertisers or whether or not Mm -hmm. your context has to be existentially and in reality held in a highest level of security that we haven't seen before in this industry. Do you you buy into that? I, I definitely I, I think that there has to be some kind of a protocol or some kind of a baseline agreement on what are we going to do with that data. Um, there's there has to be some kind of a warm and fuzzy between you know these interfaces and the people who are using them on only and mainly because voice is such an intimate uh, interface uh, and people are going to talk to it in a way that is probably not as cold or as functional. As they do with um, you know something that where you push you know push buttons and, and drop downs, um, so I think I don't know if if we can see the giants coming together on a round table and coming up with the W three C protocol, um, but I do think that um, I think if we are going to have a um, you know an interface where people are comfortable talking to it, there has to be at least a set of um, guidelines or a set of agreements with the user about what this information, uh, where it's going to live, uh, how long it's going to live, what, is, what, are, uh, what are these big companies going to do with them and so forth. I think, I think that, that that issue is going to come to a head and it's going to come to a head because of the intimacy that we have with language. And I think what we are seeing right now with this, um, it's called hysterical, sort of hysterical, but it's an indication of a real thing uh, because people do take language a lot more seriously in terms of intimacy than they do uh, with the other more um, common functional, purely functional uh, interfaces we've, we've been engaged with so far. I mean, I think, I think um, what both these guys have said is very valid. It's... Um, voice is somehow more personal. So saying um, that I'm going to share with you snippets of my audio or, or words that I've spoken somehow see, seems like a much more personal thing than it does to say, oh, yep. I've clicked boxes, mm-hmm. you know, A out of A through D, and, you know, I've selected this from a drop-down menu. Somehow that, even though they might be actually doing the exact same thing in terms of what they're, um, what they're giving an application or a skill. So I think, 
it, it's sort of a mental and emotional um, attachment uh, that we have to our voice and to what we say that makes it feel more private um, than actually inputting, even inputting via text. I mean, we enter things via text boxes all yep. the time, and we don't worry about that information being saved somewhere. So like I think Gmail. it's sort of a visceral thing. <laughs> like Gmail, like, like all our yeah. life is in Gmail, Absolutely. and nobody's, nobody's bothered by that. And they're like, parsing you know, the emails and giving, you know, suggested responses even. I mean, that could be considered an invasion so, of privacy. So you make an interesting point, Lisa, and I, I don't want to belabor too much, but you're saying that you're feeling the existential threat, the psychological threat of the actual sound of people's voices and maybe the background context versus the raw text that came from that voice shared with the developer. Is, is, is that where you think the line is drawn? Yeah, I mean, I think that just, it feels more personal to give. Makes a lot of sense. Um, That's brilliant. Actual audio. Um, yeah. than even transcriptions or, um, you know, or written text. So, How much of a concern can you have when you're selling thousands of dots a second, Brian, or whatever you yeah. you, you mentioned that I think I saw on Twitter yeah. you were saying there's a th- thousands yeah, of dots peaks. sold per second. Like, yeah, go, please, can tell me how much privacy matters to you. Yeah. Um, yeah. But uh, one thing that would be cool, though, is if developers can see your transcripts on how you've talked to Alexa, it would be great if the user could see it too. You know, I mean, the user can see their Google searches. The user can see, um, you know, different information. I'm, you know, as a user of an Echo Show, I I sit there from time to time and I look at it. And I think, what what are you capturing? You know, are you capturing every word or what are you? You know, you sort of look at it with suspicion sometimes, and uh, it, it might be good if they provided that data to to all users. Otherwise, they just the biggest crime they could commit is having stuff that doesn't work. So they need to just turn everything over to developers they, that they need. Yeah. S- story number two, Google clashes with Amazon in voice assistant price war around Amazon's annual prime day. So there's a lot, a lot of meat on the bones here. Amazon, uh, has a real juggernaut on their hands with prime day and, uh, Google's gotten in on the action with a, with a bundle. Brian, I'm going to throw this to you. Um, since I know you followed this probably more closely than anybody, um, what should we, uh, the layman, and what should people in the in in the tech industry take away from what took place, uh, the the end results on Prime Day? Well, wow, there's a lot to say about it, but I'll try to be really concise. Um, we are in the midst of the very early days of the voice first revolution, and it is a revolution in the sense that it is overturning a lot of the prior assumptions and how people are going to interact with what we call computers. Uh, what we call computers have fundamentally changed when we went to uh, glass and typing on glass and the mobile revolution. This revolution is no different. Uh, and you, you're absolutely correct. There is a demand. I mean, this is, let's get a perspective here. Amazon's one of the largest retailers on the planet. And on holiday season 2016, the best-selling item was Echo Dot. Prime Day, an invention of Amazon, which has now gotten its momentum to such a point where some reporters and some analysts, uh, CNBC reported that billions of dollars were lost in productivity because of people going online to see what's going on on Prime Day. <laughs> and yeah, it's, it's, it's phenomenal and it's brilliant on Amazon's part. And it co- coincides with back to school, by the way. That's the, uh, the folklore of how it started. And dog days of summer, people aren't shopping. Let's make a new shopping day. It worked brilliantly. But now Echo Dot, largest selling item in Amazon's uh, Prime Day, uh, and not only at Prime Day, but they started Prime Day on July 5th, and it was called Alexa Day or Alexa Shopping Day. And so anybody who had a voice for a system, an Alexa system, they were able to get early deals, and some of those deals were phenomenal. So Amazon's going full out on this. And while most of the other tech companies are calling them smart speakers and just kind of saying it's for music... There's a guy up in Washington kind of laughing, that big Jeff Bezos smile, saying, yeah, you keep thinking it's about music. Meanwhile, I'm selling a lot of these. And let me tell you, you're not buying an Echo Dot for music. The speaker is not high fidelity. It's okay. It's not, it, but it's not great. You can do better on your speakerphone on your uh, on your mobile. So, and, and yes, of course, you can Bluetooth it. But my point is, people are fascinated with this. 
they're not just using at one time like a novelty and they're exploding uh, use cases. And we're going to start seeing that. Um, nobody's got real hard numbers publicly. I can tell you uh, that a few people I know have ascertained some great insights. Uh, some insiders have told me, yes, it did peak at thousands per second. Uh, the numbers are high as millions were sold. I think that's a little blue sky. But I would say we're approaching uh, maybe a million or so sold uh, during the whole prime cycle from the beginning on July 5th to the end on July 12th. Uh, and so it is clear that we are moving forward. Now, what does that mean for Google? It means for Google, they have to understand what exactly is driving the psychology. And one of the things that are driving it is voice commerce. And whenever I say that to people, they still scratch their head. Like when I said web commerce or mobile commerce years ago, it's like, uh, it's intangible. I can't touch it and feel it. But you have an echo show, right, Bradley? And, and, and you can actually see it when you need to see it. A lot of times you don't need to see Scotty paper towels. You just order it. You know, there's certain things. And as you go down the Maslow tree of hierarchy of buying, after a while, you're going to see that almost 80% of what you want to buy, you really don't need to see, especially things like food ordering, which is going to explode in the next uh, year and two. And I can tell you there's some very large quick service food companies that are going to fundamentally change the way we order food. We're never going to use our thumbs again once we can say, well, I hope it's not order a Big Mac. I don't want to be negative here, but let's just say order me something really healthy. And, um, and your uh, personal assistant orders it and it's ready and it knows when you're going to pick it up or it's going to be delivered. It's going to be phenomenal. So a big deal, the Prime Day, Ground Zero, Echo Dot. I, I'm, I'm told that in the top 10 was Echo itself, which was cut by almost $100. And it was a steal. Uh, so the Echo Dot and the Echo Original are selling like hotcakes, even post-Prime Day. So we're going to see a lot of use come from that if there's thousands of these. Yeah, I mean, I think, one, I was really impressed from the very beginning when the Echo launched in terms of the adoption. Just the idea that there would be um, a voice-first product like this without a screen, uh, you know, really just the minimal cards. Um and that it would be that popular. And I think um, some of the things that Brian brought up are really true. There are um, things that you absolutely do not need a visual experience for. And I think we're realizing that even as consumers, when I'm ordering cat litter, um, you know, reordering anything that I've seen before and I already know, it's really only in the cases where you're browsing um, for something that's extremely visual, say it's clothing or, um, you know, jewelry, uh, some, something that has a strong aesthetic. Um, but other than that, I think the, the being driven by shopping is an interesting point, right? This is, um, there is some good data and I, I can't quote it exactly, so I won't try and be wrong, um, that shows in households where there is an echo device you know the the um spending on amazon is boosted obviously because it's that much easier it's another channel um into amazon's marketplace and google really doesn't um have that aspect to it i mean how many people do you know on a daily basis that use amazon versus um do any sort of google shopping it's a very different um very different market so uh, so I think that, you know, Amazon's done a great job of um, pushing not just the Echo itself, but all the cases where you can use it to um, to order things. They put that in the commercials and so on and so forth. So it's not just for um, asking trivia and listening to music, although it does a great job for that, too. It's also a uh, device to use for, for shopping, and it's a very effective one. Yeah. So my number one observation is I love competition. I'm very glad that uh, even giants have to compete against each other. Um, so I, I hope that, uh, so now I'm cheering for everybody else other than Amazon. Um, I love Amazon. I was there and so forth. But I want the competition to survive and thrive. Uh, number one. Number two, I don't, um, I, don't, I don't know what 
what Google is, is uh, uh, why did they go ahead and play the game of Amazon? I think they should just have kept their cool and sold um, and differentiated themselves and, and not cut prices and, 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 and just sell, uh, sell on a value proposition. I think they definitely have uh, a lot to offer, and I think they need to leverage all the properties that they have. Everybody uses Gmail, everybody uses Gmail Calendar, and, uh, I mean, uh, Google Calendar. So they have a lot of assets they need to leverage. I think they just need to calm down, come up with a strategy. Amazon strategy has been very clear from the get-go. They're not in the business of selling hardware. They're selling hardware to get market share in terms of usage, in terms of promoting their baseline business, which is commerce. Google is about something else. I think they just need to sit down, reflect, come up with a strategy, and then pursue that strategy doggedly in a way that is as focused as Amazon is, is pursuing theirs. Um, so it's going to be interesting to watch how this, this all of this unfolds. I got to I gotta regroup and echo what uh, both Lisa and Ahmed said about uh, uh, not only Google, but Apple and Microsoft. Uh, all of these companies have fundamentally strong platforms that they can build around. Commerce is going to be playing a strong part in everybody's platform at some point, but you really need to pay, pay attention to what your users could really use it for. And I think part of the problem is people that are yep. coming up with some of yep. these ideas are over-engineering it. They're getting overly concerned with, that's well, right. that's not what I would do. I would just check, check my Gmail. And Ahmed made, made a, a perfect point. You know, your Gmail account could be ground zero for an incredible revolution inside of Google. It just takes get, listening to the right people because I know they have some amazing people inside of Google. I just hope that they listen to their voices. And I mean that really literally because they could actually make a renaissance inside of the company. And the same is true with Apple and Microsoft. I think the problem, and I don't want to hurt anybody's feeling that's running these departments, the problem is... Just like when Steve Jobs walked into the Palo Alto Research Center and said, guys, you got a product already. And they said, no, those engineers would have spent another 20 years fine tuning it. Steve just took it, ran with it, mm -hmm. and, and we're mm -hmm. living with that. And I think that's what needs to go on inside of Google. Uh, that renaissance needs to go inside of Google, Apple, Microsoft, and even at Samsung to some, some degree. Oh, yeah. And, and to finalize what Lisa said, yes, it's 10% lift approximately when somebody has an Echo device and shopping on an Echo device. So it's a very real lift in transaction volume that Amazon's exper experiencing. In fact, in the latest uh, posting I did with Reed multiplex.com i posted an article where i pointed out that amazon could start giving away echo dots for free just by the fact of the lift that they get from transactions so mm -hmm. keep an eye out mm -hmm. in the future these devices will be free at some point it's hard to see what amazon did on prime day as anything else except a resounding exclamation point success for voice technology um all around so that's great we'll move on to Story number three, which is that Google has launched something called Gradient Ventures, which is an investment fund to, quote, provide capital, resources, and education to what they call AI-first startups. So, Ahmed, I'm going to start with you. Um, also, I should mention that Toyota launched another fund uh, similar uh, with similar scope um, to this, but uh, I intentionally left that out. Google, uh, this has been talked about. Some people are upset because the investments that Google makes with this in investment fund are going to stay on their balance sheet. I think that's um, probably trivial. But Ahmed, what, how do you, especially uh, being founder of a startup in the space, what do you, what does this signal to you? What do you take away from this uh, news story? They would do a massive service to the whole space if they didn't think like, coders and thought that the, the world revolves around coding uh, or around technology, right? I think they need to think about how do we build an ecosystem for the conversational, um, the voice-first uh, conversational interface, which, which, um, which should attract talents across the board, um, not only engineers, but you need to have anthropologists, you need to have people who know how to craft language, and you need to have people who know how to on uh, a test for voice, uh, there's a whole ecosystem um, that needs to be built. And I would love for somebody who has money, whether it's Amazon, whether it's whether it's Google, or whether it's Microsoft, 
to start thinking holistically. I mean, you just look at Amazon, for example, and they do hackathon after hackathon after hackathon after hackathon. And I've shared this concern with the, with the people at Amazon um, since we are a partner of theirs and so we get to speak our mind is please don't call them hackathons because when you call something a hackathon, anybody who's not a hacker is not going to show up. Call it something else. Um, be more inclusive because you will need all of that talent to take these skills that continue to be um, sub-mediocre to the next level, um, in addition to other things that need to happen, but at least start attracting the right, uh, or start exciting, start evangelizing to the whole spectrum of talent is needed. So, I mean, these ventures, they call them uh, AI first, or whatever they want to call them. If the bottom line is that it is going to be centered around development and technology, we're not going to move them with the ball four. We're going to expand horizontally, but not three-dimensionally, I would say. Well, I just want to echo what I said. I mean, I see a lot of investment in the underlying technology and not so much in the understanding of how to use it um, properly and how to, um, you know, obviously I'm biased here, but, but how to design something that actually works properly mm -hmm. is very different mm -hmm. from, from how to just hack, you know, <laughs> hack together some code. That really isn't the challenging part. And I actually participated in a... Um, in an all-day workshop at Amazon reInvent last fall where I was just really disappointed. They said, oh, well, we're just teaching the development. I said, you know, the design that that you're having us um, implement is really, you know, non-intuitive and, it, you know, it's not a good voice user interface and, and couldn't you have had one of your uh, designers put this together? And he said, oh, no, no, but we really just want to teach the coding. And I said, well, but now what you're doing is you're sending all these you know, a hundred people back to their companies with this as an example. So I think you know, the investment in technology is important. That's where it all starts. But I think we have to um, also look at, at things as an investment in the um, applications and, and creating the proper applications. And I think that's why, you know, places like Witlingo are important because they actually um, take something which is very intimidating um, you know, hosting and, and designing your own uh, voice-driven skill uh, and, and make it accessible to, um, to certain other people. So I think that's an important thing to have in the industry. Well, I got I to gotta say what Lisa and Ahmed has said is brilliant and beautiful. You know, I'm going to get philosophical here. The, part of the problem and what Lisa pointed out is very, very critical here is let's look at the wording, AI first. AI is the underlying technology. It's like talking about the engine in your car and not the driving experience or what the automobile represents emotionally to the user. The interface that's going to interact with AI at the end of the day is going to be your voice. All right. Sooner or later, we're going to give up our thumbs because there's a cognitive load and a mechanical load. Broca's area is already giving us a voice. Everything we ever type is already a narrative, a voice in our brain. And so what we got to slow down and try to use two thumbs, de-evolve to try to interact with it. So the fundamental issue here is, and I've had this argument with a lot of um, AI researchers and some of these executives at these companies. I go, you need to change your thoughts about this fundamentally. And I can understand how how it's happening. Engineers and technologists are coming up with the future. They're saying, oh my gosh, we have AI. We're going to leave with AI. That's cool. At the end of the day, the AI is going to drift to the back. Nobody's going to care what's in the engine. Most people who buy a car, they don't, they don't ask how the, um, the fuel injector works or if you've got a Tesla, exactly what kind of uh, battery operating system mm -hmm. is working. Mm -hmm. What people care about is the interface. We talk about the graphic user interface. We didn't talk about the processors. We just cared whether or not things moved around the screen quicker. And what Lisa's saying is brilliant. What we really need to do is create a renaissance of pulling people into this world that are otherwise barred from it. And, and what Ahmed said, calling them hackathons is ridiculous. Let's just stop it. What we need to start doing is finding ways to pull people who are brilliant in constructing conversations and brilliant in understanding human interactions with each other and to try to build that functionality within us reacting to the computer. We have spent the last 60 years trying to be more like the computer. The next 60 years is a computer is going to be trying to be more like us and understanding us. And there's a turning point. We're here right now, yeah. this moment. Yeah. And we're shaping it, all of us on this show. We're at this turning point where the, where the change is going to come 
where we just say things to our personal assistants. Obviously, we're very early days here, and it understands us. It understands us to a deep level, and it acts upon it like a big lever, right? A lever gives you more power. So we're not sifting and sorting at the end of a Google search. When we say, find this, it knows our context. It finds the right answer, gives it to us. When we are shopping, find this. It knows our tastes, what we like, colors, and it shows us maybe two or three things that we might like instead of nine million things that a Google search drops on our, on our lap. So it's a shift in mentality. It's a shift of maybe letting the, the creative people take over this technology once again, just like Steve Jobs allowed the creative people to take over the technology for the graphic user interface revolution and the mobile revolution. Today, the unfortunate part about it is we're not seeing it yet, and not even from Apple. There just seems to be this fear that we got to make it very exacting and it's got to be, you know, only certain types of utterances which are stupid and boring in a lot of cases. And I mean stupid in a nice way. I mean stupid in a way that it was constructed in, in, in an interaction that humans never mm-hmm. have, mm-hmm. right? A stupid interaction is we don't want facts. When I, when I say this, when I say, hey, what's the traffic like? I don't need to know Mm -hmm. all the statistics. I just want to know if I'm going to get to my appointment on time. And my AI is going to understand that sooner than we Mm -hmm. realize. And the company that understands that is going to rule. Does that make sense? Makes perfect sense. Wonderful. Uh, That's that's, that's great analysis. Uh, Moving on to story number four. We got an analyst report this week uh, that's kind of interesting. Siri usage over the last year has dropped significantly as Alexa and Cortana use has risen. Um, Siri remains the most popular virtual assistant with 41.4 million monthly active users in the U.S., but has seen a 15% decline since last year, or 7.3 million monthly users. In addition, the study found that engagement with Siri has also dropped by nearly half during this period, from 21% to 11%. And Brian, I'll start with you on this. Um... What do we take away from this? Is this as bad for Apple as it sounds like, or is this just something that's happened because the Echo got popular and can easily change tomorrow? Great question. Um, I can say it in one phrase. Neglect has its consequences. Uh, Apple owned this marketplace in uh, very early days. Uh, SRI International created Siri uh, from a military contractor uh, uh, contract, essentially, and um, it became a spun a spinoff. And it was the last dying act that Steve did before he passed away. I mean, literally, was to acquire Siri, and, and he his last major executive decision. He saw it as the future of of Apple. Um, I think I'm a fan of Apple. I'm a deep fan of Apple. I um, I love the company. But there is no other way to look at it than this is a, an entirely bad uh, element of neglect. They lost most of the Siri team. They had the opportunity to acquire the Viv team. They didn't. And that was fundamentally dumb on their part since they already lost these guys. They should have got them back. Viv was incredible technology, and I hope to see it. Uh, we don't see it yet. Bixby uh, at Samsung is not Viv technology. And for those who don't know, The folks that formed Viv were the former Siri team uh, that left Apple after about a year, a year and a half uh, on average. It's a bad sign, but it's it's also hopefully a good sign. What it should be is a warning sign to Apple to wake up and stop just looking at this as some sort of appendage and give it the rights that it should have. This is a brand new operating system. It's a brand new modality. Build around it. Let's not call it a smart speaker anymore. Let's call it what it is. You know, I call it a voice first device. Make up something else. I tried. Twitter's only got so many characters, so it's voice first for me. But, you know, name it, own it, have a voice OS, call it voice OS, call it Siri OS, do whatever you need to do, but really build this new modality. And there is an inner turmoil within every one of these companies. Let me tell you, every one of the companies, all the tech companies, I have insiders that talk to me all the time because I'm a lightning rod for this. I talk about it a lot. And they beg me, please help me. Come work at the company. Do whatever you can. Shake somebody. Let's move forward on this. Apple has that ambition inside. And if there's an Apple executive listening to me who might get mad at me, inside of your company right now are teams of people, people that have 
not necessarily the best engineering skills, but the skills that Lisa and Ahmed were talking about that want to take over this process and want to grow Siri into the right direction to make it more responsive and to start investing in a, into better microphone technology, which, by the way, we'll hopefully see in the new iPhone. Uh, one of the f- reasons that Siri's dropped, just put a nut on this, the reason why Siri dropped is the expectations raised. And the expectations raised because it is brilliant far field technology and that radial microphone array that Amazon built in the Echo. It it was a high watermark. And when you go back to your phone, your iPhone specifically, that has a microphone designed for speakerphone conversation, optimized for that and not for, you know, uh, voice recognition, you're going to have a very unpleasant experience. I can tell you that HomePod has an enormously better microphone technology. It might even be better than Amazon's. Uh, I only had a very brief time to interact with it. And if the iPhone is built voice first, they're going to have a lot of increase in the use of Siri. And uh, Google, by the way, is doing really well, but I wouldn't have done two microphones. Sorry, Google folks. You need at least four microphones in that system to work correctly. I I mean, I guess neglect is is a good word for it. I've just seen a lot of um, you know, we were the first, um, Siri is, is still the leader. It's almost an arrogance um, that has not uh, forced them to innovate uh, within that team. And I know, um, you know, they lost a lot of folks uh, that, that left Apple. But I think they haven't put a lot of emphasis on rebuilding that and in specifically in the expertise that um, Ahmed and I were talking about. Um, not just developers, not just technology people, but real true designers. And if you think of um, also what Amazon did fairly quickly, which um, you know Siri never made available, is having this um, developer uh, ability to add skills and opening up as a platform. And I think that's something that um, Apple being a very closed place uh, sort of missed out on. Um, letting people design their own um, functionality for a personal system. Uh, it is to be expected. It is to be expected that the uh, usage will drop, obviously, because people are going to use the, uh, the um, you know, the uh, the Echo at home, but Siri outside of the home. I would be interested in seeing whether, because people are using voice a lot more at home because of Echo, whether whether uh, using Siri outside of the home has picked up. Number one, number two, I think they uh, echoing uh, Brian's uh, observation. I think um, they missed big time on in terms of capitalizing on uh, on their early lead as far as Siri. And number three, I think um, I think we will see a, a pickup again of Siri when uh, when the home part comes in. Um, and I think uh, I think the, I think they will will see some redress there. I think um, because people who have Siri will be able to use. It at will use voice at home as well as outside of the home. So I don't think again. I think as I said last week, never ever um, discount um, uh, or or uh, or, uh, or think that Apple is going to be out of the game in any way, or shape or form. So now we turn to story number five, which is that Samsung and Galaxy S8 users are doing battle right now over the Bixby button. This is a fascinating one. There is a, apparently a Bixby button. I don't have a Galaxy phone, but there's a Bixby button on the Galaxy S8 that's designed to hit it, and you activate Bixby. And apparently Bixby didn't work right at first, and Galaxy users or Android users and used to be able to customize everything, and, and uh, but yet Samsung won't let them customize this. Ahmed, what do you make of this uh, battle going on over the Bixby button right now? Well, I'm, I'm just going to make a general point, which is I am not uh, a fan of uh, paternalistic um, dictates from giants, whether it's uh, whether it's Steve Jobs deciding that, hey, you guys uh, who are not as smart as I am, I'm going to tell you that you don't need the floppy uh, or you don't need the jack, uh, Apple now taking a jack. I just, I just find that offensive. So anything that comes from on top on and is imposed on others is something that I am not very keen on. So I'll just leave the thought at that. Um, I think uh, I think the uh, the direction that should be taken should come from customers. It should should be a conversation. Um, um, some people might say, "Well, wasn't Steve Jobs right to take the floppy out?" Uh, and I say, "Well, you know, I I use the thumb drive right now to be able to take my files from computer A to computer B. You know, so I I still I still use a thing." 
to uh, be able to transport things when I when the cloud is not doing its thing. Um, so um, the bottom line is it should be more of a of an organic uh, solution to to problems as opposed to somebody who thinks that they are being benevolent um, uh, imposing upon us uh, what is how it should be because they know better than us. Um, and that's just a gut reaction. Well, you know, I, I'm going to echo what Ahmed said. You know, in the Android world, it's an egalitarian sort of environment. And, you know, I understand what, you know, Samsung is trying to do. And there is something to be said about uniformity in your design. And one of the beautiful things that attract me to Apple is that they've developed a uniformity in their design. They created their, their own reference platform because it's the only platform. And things are where you expect them to be. You go into the Android world, things can be all over the place. Uh, icons can be here. Some buttons don't operate the way they should. And obviously, manufacturers can create their own buttons. And this creates confusion. Yes, the problem with Bixby is it is not Viv. It is something that was developed actually to work very well with Korean language. And there are really tremendous issues with the technology um, initially. Now, they've gone very far into correcting that. And I wouldn't bet against Samsung for correcting a lot of this. It's like Ahmed said, don't bet against Apple. I, I, I especially say don't bet against Apple. Apple is going to rise above everything uh, unless something really des- desperately goes wrong. So will all these companies. But it is probably not a good thing for Samsung to have this battle because if the system was good enough, people wouldn't want to be replacing it. And that's really the subtext to all this. Yeah, I mean, I think um, what everyone said uh, before is perfectly valid. It's really, uh, to me, though, it's, you know, buttons and remapping buttons and all that stuff is kind of a, um, that's that's maybe a territorial thing uh, for people over hardware. <laughs> uh, I like that. I, I think that, to me, you know, one of the great things about um the Echo device and, and even having Hey Siri and OK Google is is the, the not needing a button. And that's sort of where I stand is that, you know, to, to whatever extent we get to a point where we don't need buttons at all, or we're per- purely using wake words, um, that that would be uh, totally fine with me. So, I, I mean, I, I understand the argument about it. Um, going back and forth, I think it's, it's like I said, it's sort of a, a territorial um, territorial thing. I completely agree with you, uh, Lisa and Brian and Ahmed. Um, I think that's probably probably a sign you need to go back to the drawing board rather than cram something down somebody's throat. Um, just my two cents. Moving on to story number six, and this is an interesting one as well. Best Buy shares declined 7.5%. I think it was more than that before they rebounded a little bit on the news that Amazon is launching its own version of Geek Squad. And Lisa, I'll start with you for this. Um, What are your thoughts? How does this story strike you? And how do you think this will um, facilitate the evolution evolution of of, uh, uh, voice voice first? first? Well, I mean, just it's really, it comes down to, I mean, first of all, Amazon is just obviously planning to take over the world completely. So we should all be prepared for that. Um, but the the whole um, using voice, for example, with your Echo, think of how nice it would be. Um, I'm looking at my outdated TV right now, and I've been dying to um, to upgrade it. But I had bought it in store, and I had uh, Geek Squad install it. And I was thinking, gosh, if I order another one via Amazon, I'm going to have to figure out how all the nuts and bolts of um, getting this redone. How great would it be if, you know, voice first, I could say, order, um, you know, this new whatever Sony Bravia in X size and um, include installation from Amazon. And then it's one step and I know how much the whole package costs. And um, I mean, to to remove that uh, that layer of you know, pain from the customer, I think is really what, what Amazon is doing and what they're, um, what they've been sort of great at doing in general. If you look at sort of the evolution of the company is just do one thing, sell books online really, really, really well, and then turn that into selling everything online really, really well. And I think, um, 
if they do this successfully, this is going to be um, you know a great additional uh, offering from them. Uh, I have to say what Lisa said was brilliant. Absolutely. Um, you know, really, when we go outside the tech areas of this country, and it's very easy for us, all, uh, all of us are technologists and nerds and stuff, and we can kind of, you know, see things happen very quickly. The rest of the world, but most definitely the rest of the United States, uh, outside these tech corridors, are moving at a much different pace. And they confront the things that Lisa brought up every single day of their life. And you have uh, people that are too old. There are people who just don't understand the technology. And so getting into somebody's home, which has really been the subtext of what Amazon's been trying to do with Alexa and, and now with this version of in, uh, in-home uh, service, is, is extremely valuable for the company. Because... We're not just talking about entertainment. We're talking about home automation on a massive scale. And this is going to take place. Most people don't have the wherewithal to do even some of the basics. I mean, certainly people can install light bulbs. But as we move down the, um, the pyramid of all the different systems that people are going to wind up doing, such as uh, thermostats and uh, you know, all the, uh, some advanced lighting systems, sound systems throughout their home, uh, how to integrate uh, all these new Echo products. Because most definitely Amazon's going to come out with a high fidelity, uh, you know, Echo system very soon also. So Best Buy should be concerned, but it also should be a rallying call because, listen, there's not just going to be one brand. There's just not going to be one solution. No market ever develops this one brand, one solution. And uh, like Ahmed had mentioned before, this incredible amount of competition is going to be really great for this market. And uh, by the way, we haven't seen everybody enter the market. We're going to have at least 10 more major companies enter the voice first market over the next 12 months. And they are all going to be massive and they're going to be surprises. And uh, Best Buy must best maybe look at this and say, okay, what are we going to do? We're going to lead with voice. We're going to lead with home automation. We're going to own what we own. And they own a lot of the uh, local market. You know, if I was consulting for Best Buy, I, I got a plan right now on what they could do uh, and, and move uh, massively. Not by blocking Amazon, but potentially by working with them. You embrace your enemy uh, if you want to see it as an enemy. No, that's great. And I think that uh, Amazon... Um this is a good move for Amazon, but they got to be careful. And we talked earlier about privacy concerns. Amazon can do what they're doing with the Echo and the Echo Show and the Echo Dot and the Echo Tap and all these different things because they have cultivated such a brand identity of being trusted. And they're trusted for a number of reasons. They're trusted because every time people interact with them on a customer service basis, something you know, through retail, they do a good job. Uh, they're trusted for, for many different reasons, but if people get the sense, this could easily turn around on them if they're not careful, this whole geek squad competitor, um, if it's seen as some sort of Trojan horse to, uh, you know, to get inroads on people's privacy or, or, or not, you know, not in the end serve the customer uh, as much as they should be, um, it can quickly turn negative. As long as they don't do that, uh, Best Buy's got a whole lot to worry about, and that was great analysis uh, from both of y'all. Let's go to story number seven, which, uh, Brian, what you're saying is a great segue. Motley Fool openly wondered this week why Microsoft is releasing a, in their words, Me Too, and actually that's probably my words too, smart home speaker that doesn't appear to stand out. And we talked a little bit about this last week. When are, uh, Brian, my question do these companies understand that they can't just release another competitor without some sort of killer app? Or is Microsoft just going to release some nameless, faceless thing that is just going to end up on the clearance bin two months later? Really great, great questions here. And I, I think um, I, I'm certainly still have some great insight on this. And part of the problem, uh, and it's a theme that we're going to probably have all the time in the show and, and most definitely what I've said today. Part of the problem is we have engineers and technologists that are putting this stuff out and they're looking at it from a practical standpoint and they're say, thinking that people just want to hear facts and they just want to get, you know, uh, you know, how many miles are we from the sun and exact things like that. And I use the, the traffic scenario again as a really good, everybody can get this, but I have thousands of them. But the traffic scenario is, you know, 
If I'm asking you in the car, mobile, what's the traffic like, and you know my calendar, and you know that I am X number of miles on my way to an appointment, the answer I'm looking for isn't what the traffic is like. The existential question is what I'm really looking for. And this is the voice first stuff that I build, is what I work in my lab on all the time. And it uses all kinds of psychological insights about how humans operate. And, you know, I go all the way down to Broca, Zaria, and all the way up to the existential mind. But what the existential question is, am I going to be late for this meeting? And that's the question that needs to be answered. When you have a company that's primarily driven by engineers build these devices and build their voice first interfaces, they're going to create what appears to be maybe a me too product. It may be incredibly good. The technology might be the best, right? But the functionality because of how humans communicate may be much lower. And you know, what, what, what Lisa's brought up and what Ahmed has brought up, uh, you know, how do people really interact? So I'd really like to ask Lisa, how do you feel about Cortana and how it interacts in Windows? And do you think that that's, just drop that into a speaker and everything's fine. Do you think that's the way to do it? Yeah, you know, it's really interesting because people ask me about Cortana all the time. In my previous company, um, I was working on, um, you know, human-machine interactions for cars and our um, CEO happened to be a board member at Microsoft, so everyone said, oh, okay, we're going to assume that, you know, Microsoft is a potential partner here. And they said, you know, what do you think in terms of Microsoft technology? And I said, um, you know, you look at how they're installed on desktops, how well, they, how well it works, even if you've tried it on mobile, it works very well. Um, I don't think it's a technology problem. Um, I don't think it's very strong wrong necessarily on um, design and and personality. Like if I were to ask you what Siri is like, um, you would have some definite input on that. If I were to ask you what Alexa is like, you would have some input on that as well. Um, Okay, Google is is deliberately neutral. We all know that. Um, But then if you were to say Cortana, it it would almost be as though it wasn't deliberately designed. Like, no one would say, oh, it's trying to be neutral like Google, but it really has the personality more like Siri. They would just say, uh, Cortana, you know, it never it just didn't occur to me what, what, their, what the persona was. And, and, and I think that, um, you know, a lot of us in the, in the voice field know this. This is a very dangerous thing. If you don't deliberately design a personality and you have one that happens accidentally because it will um, people attribute uh, you know personal traits once there is a voice then that personality can be all over the place and so I think it's sort of lacking in the design field um, in terms of uh, you know if you were to ask personal questions or sort of even the consistency of how it responds but um in terms of technology, I think it's very strong. I just don't see, I guess, what the differentiator is going to be. You know, Lisa brings up an incredible point here. And, you know, humans will anthropomorphize anything. I mean, you just put anything visual. Uh, humans will, t- you know, a dog has got a personality. This, this belief, again, this is what happens when engineers and technologists take over. I... I completely disagree with Google's uh, neutral uh, stance. First off, it needs a name, in my view. And if you don't choose a name, people are going to give it a name, and it's probably not going to be a pleasant name. People don't want to be saying a company's name all day long if they're going to be interacting with this. It was a strategically huge mistake. Um, I believe that you should be scripting, whoever you are building, and whether you're the company building the voice for a platform or whether you're building an app, you need, to, you need to build the personality first. You need to storyboard it. I'm in Southern California in Hollywood, and I work with a lot of creative people that storyboard this. And if you're a brand, if you're a company, and you're not storyboarding your brand as far as what a voice-first system is going to sound like, and I'm, I'm not just including the voice. That's a big part of it, tonality, inflection, all of this stuff. But this attitude that we're, we're hardwired to detect 
We're listening to our mom's voice before we enter the exit the womb. We already know voice before we know anything else, and we can detect voice much quicker and much more accurately the moment we pop into this world, and we can detect the nuances. It, it's been said that most people can understand the differences in over 39,000 voices. I think the number is a little higher, but that's where these studies kind of stopped. The, you cannot detect the differences of 39,000 people at a distance, but you certainly can in somebody's voice. So the brain is designed for this. And the fact that there is just this myopia in design uh, that's taking place, you know, what I would say for uh, Microsoft, they have strong points. Everybody has a strong point. But you have to go to ground zero. You have to listen to folks like Lisa, who's been doing this for a long time. Another person is incredible is Nandini uh, Stoker over at uh, Google. These people have worked in voice for a very long time. They build these interfaces because they understand how humans interact with systems. And once we get to that point, then we've now created a relationship between the user and the personality and the device. And if you think that that doesn't matter... That might be your extinction. If you're in a large company and you're putting out a voice first platform and you don't think that that stuff is a big deal, that is your that is the beginning of your uh, uh, post-Cambrian explosion. This is your extinction uh, message. It's not like you're going to go away and die. It's just going to shrink down and become less relevant because the companies that get the true elements of human interactions are going to dominate this, especially as we go into the next phases, which, by the way, is probably not going to be next week or next year, but it's going to be soon enough for people to make note. And yes, Amazon has gotten a little bit uh, ahead, and Siri actually is doing really good. I, I, I don't necessarily think the new version of Siri is as snarky, uh, but you know, maybe that snark is changing to something more mature. I don't know, but personality is definitely there. So, yeah, I fully agree with what Lisa said. Yeah, I think another um, interesting thing that we haven't talked about um, and, you know, sort of came up with the Echo um, the Echo show, I believe it is. There's, there's the look in the show, and they came out around the same time, so I get confused occasionally. Um, but, you know, when you start having these multimodal interactions, um, to, to still think of it um, as here's a voice system that's being supported by graphics. I've worked a lot on, um, as I said, these car systems where it really was, okay, let's do the screens first, we do the screens first, we do the screens first, and then we tack on the voice. And I think um, the way the Echo has been... Um, has evolved in the way that all these other products have come to the market is, is great, you know, for people like me who, as I said, have been waiting for, for, you know, decades for this to happen where it really is, it's first a conversation and there are elements of conversation that we all enjoy. There are reasons that there are some people you like to talk to and some people you don't. And those elements of conversation are things that we, that we pull away from interactions with automated systems. There are, there's a, you know, good taste in your mouth after you have a successful conversation with an automated system, the same as there is when you have with a person and that makes you want to interact with them again. And I think, um, you know, watching these systems evolve, watching the multi-turn dialogues become more successful, um, watching people feel more comfortable in general with speech recognition is is, you know, really exciting um, for me. And I think, you know, that's going to continue for the next um, many years. And I think, you know, all the big players should be in it at this point. So it's no surprise that that Microsoft is there. It's just a matter of how, how does one differentiate oneself at this point um, when there already are some good solutions out there. All excellent points. Lisa and Brian, thank you very much. We're going to move on to number eight. Our final story of the week, and this is an interesting one that I'm sure um, is just the beginning of us talking about on this show and other Voice First FM shows. There was an article that came out, I'm going to pull it up now, uh, about how Mississippi and Utah both are among the first, if not the first, to roll out Alexa skills. So Mississippi and Utah both have... Alexa skills uh, out now. Uh, Mississippi has one related to vehicle licensing and registration. Utah has one related to um, 
fishing uh, and wildlife um, and being able to for uh, state residents to be able to find out information about fishing hotspots, so on and so forth. And Lisa, for this last story, I'll start with you once again. Does it uh, concern you to see government using uh, voice first technology and, and embracing it? Uh, or uh, are you, for the most part, just thrilled that um, we're, we're seeing uh, this sort of uh, progression uh, out of these type of entities already at this point? Honestly, I am sort of shocked and amazed that it, if government, it, usually government's sort of the last to jump on board, um, a little bit late to the game. But just the fact that that these are these are sort of fun, interesting applications, particularly the the fishing one. Um, I think it's great that the government, you know, that any government entities, especially sort of not, you know, non California, non New York, right. Um, are, are sort of dipping their toes in the water here and, and trying this out. Um, I'd be interested, you know, to, to check them out and, and try them. But I think it, it's, it's kind of nice to see, uh, you know, what, what some of these applications are. I mean, there's a great opportunity here for education through, um, through the echo devices, you know, learning how to learning things about your state, learning things about your government, um, you know, again, the, the fishing is more hobby related, but I think it's great, honestly, if, if the government gets some practice um, with some you know, lighter apps like this and then could actually have you know, some real true informational stuff. I mean, if you look at the way, you know, to me, we used to uh, go to libraries, right, if we had to look something up. And now we'll sort of go to Google and we'll type it on our phone, but it's... Um, it's great if people can just ask the question aloud. It's kind of our, our, you know, always my last resort, right? If I can't get something done on the computer and I can't get something, you know, reach, um, you know, reach something via email or uh, via web page, then um, I always pick up the phone and call because I know that voice is the easiest way to get something done. And I think that it's great that, you know, in, in even in government, they're, seeing some ways of incorporating voice and saying, okay, if someone wants to get something done quickly, easily, efficiently, um, which is not usually what we think of with government, um, <laughs> then, then they'd actually, uh, you know, use, use voice to try and find that information. So I actually think it's, I actually think it's great. Well, you know, I, uh, I fully agree with Lisa. I think the shortest distance between, uh, you and what you want is your voice. And, um, this, uh, is, ironically echoing the things I've seen uh, in development. Let's just say there are a number of states very seriously considering converting everything in uh, that's available on their website into a voice uh, type of interaction. And it's going to be, actually some of them are going to be doing some incredibly new, more powerful things to interact with uh, representatives and uh, in, inter interact with various community organizations, things of that nature uh, you know, within their, you know, their local counties. There is also an initiative at the federal government level uh, there have been a number of uh, federal contracts that have gone out for building voice first interfaces on a federal level. Uh, this has received um, a lot of bipartisan support, uh, which is good to see at this uh, stage of life, um, to get this to move forward. And I believe that we'll start seeing the results of that by as early as this year. But most definitely next year, we're going to be able to get access to a lot of federal services, um, literally responding to forms, re making requests all the way to um, – uh, for veterans affairs and things of that l level to um, uh, information about um, traveling abroad, abroad, things of that nature. Uh, I believe that that is going to be extremely powerful. It's going to be a revolution and uh, I don't see that stopping. And it's going to be similar to what we saw what took place with websites, right? First websites were almost worthless or business cards or brochures until they became extremely, extremely useful. The point where we're filling out forms I, I hate using this terminology, but visually you understand what I'm saying. Where we're completing the form just by talking to our device, like as if somebody was interviewing us, and we're giving up that information in a very painless sort of way to get to what we need to get done, especially for people in need who need services. Now, that sounds crazy, 
but there are some people who don't have access to even an internet connection. Fine, I get that. There are some libraries that are already booking uh, echo devices into soundproof rooms where people can interact with these systems. So we're going to start seeing that. And here's the other problem, literacy. There's some people who just simply know how to speak, but they can't read or write very well. And this is lowering the bar for access, especially for uh, various government programs that can be extremely helpful. So I think it's a good sign. Yeah, if I can just uh, uh, piggyback on that, um, there, is, uh, there is a whole segment out there that, um, that can make the most of the best that voice can offer, which is to act instantaneously upon hearing an action call. So, for instance, um, a lot of activist organizations out there who are focused on, um, on a political cause or on a social cause, uh, who, for example, are watching CNN or whatever it may be, and they see a bit of news they don't, they don't like, and they are affiliated with, the, with an action group, uh, and they want to react immediately, all right? So instead of having to stop and go for to the laptop and to X, Y, and Z, they can just say, you know, uh, Alexa, ask um, so-and-so for the latest news, and they get the action calls, and they can say, uh, call my senator, and it connects them to the center, right? Uh, so we're working on a couple of skills like that, where being able to react immediately in the heat of the moment, in the flow of your engagement with content and being able to within a minute uh, left leave a voicemail to your uh, senator or or talk to staff or engage with uh, somebody who is uh, helping you mobilize um, I think there is there's a whole world there um, uh, that is um, opening up in in uh, with this interface no that's great and uh, my personal opinion on this is this is as I mentioned, that far from the last time we will be discussing this on this show, I thought the point about accessibility is really key. This is going to open doors to a lot of different types of citizens to access information and participate in meaningful ways. Um, but also, uh, you know, not to uh, not to get political, but to me, this is no surprise that this is going on in. in uh, I don't know what Utah is, but you know Mississippi being a red state. I mean, I, I think we'll see this in red and blue states all over the place. Uh, there's a lot of pressure on government to to perform, and uh, this sort of technology is just what the doctor ordered. I I, I certainly hope. Uh, I would love to do a story like this uh, every week from here on out. Uh, the government is uh, taking a more voice first uh, mentality. So I, I I agree with you all. I think the analysis is great, and hopefully we see more of this. So that is this week in voice. Lisa, Brian, Ahmed, thank you very, very much for joining us and sharing your time thank and expertise you. with us. Thank you for having us. Thank you so much. Sure. So uh, greatly appreciate uh, all of your contributions. And for This Week in Voice, Episode 2, July 13th, 2017, thank you for listening. And until next time. <laughs>